I'll tell you the distinction. In Christian view, that sin infected mankind to the extent that man could do nothing, no effort or initiative of man can save him. A man essentially is a sinful creature, and we've inherited this sin. And then in Christian view, the only way you can be saved is through the cross. In the Jewish view, that's not the case at all, and that man can do it. God created you in his image. These terms are very meaningful to both the Jew and the Christian. Can you repent and will God forgive you or not? So that's where the difference falls. Early Christians were really anti-emperor kind of. My view is different on that. Paul was protective of the empire. Rabbi Tovia Singer, what a privilege it is to have you on Unitarian Anabaptist. Um, so I wonder if you could introduce yourself to my audience. I know you're a pretty popular fella, but uh, for, the, for the benefit of those that don't know you, could give, can you give a little background of how you became a rabbi and in this field that you are presently in? My father's a rabbi and grandfather's a rabbi. In fact, my grandfather left Hungary in the early 20th century to become a rabbi in Pennsylvania. And that was a very critical move because in 1944, the rest of his family were murdered by the Nazis in the spring of 44. So the only reason I exist, of course, it's God's will, but the only reason I'm here is because he accepted a rabbinical position in Pennsylvania, came to America, and as such, he met my beautiful grandmother of blessed memory, and my father is a rabbi to this day, and, and I've devoted my life to really teaching scripture and moreover, I have devoted my life to addressing questions that Christians have about the Jewish faith. I think that Christians are asking very important questions that really deserve, uh, deserve a good answer. Thank you so much for that. Uh -huh. So did you grow up in Pennsylvania then? Is that where you, where you spent your childhood? I was born in McKeesport, which really? is right outside. Right outside yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I know the place. I think it's called... Uh -huh. Keysport General, yeah. yeah. And, but then my family came to Brooklyn. I don't know if you heard of it. It's oh, not yeah. as well known as the <laughs> Keysport. Sure. But some people have heard of it. <laughs> it's a, it's, the Jews are slowly moving in. So, okay. uh, <laughs> so I grew up in Borough Park, Brooklyn. I studied in rabbinical school and, and devoted my life to this work. People are asking very important questions, and I really want to help them out. Okay. So, would you identify yourself as like a scholar of Tanakh, of the Old Testament? Is that how you would describe yourself? You know, we, the scripture is the word of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. So there's no end to it. You know, there's no end to study. You know, every day I look at scripture and I see it in a way that I've never, never considered before. So I don't think... Religious Jews don't say things like that. Okay. We just were always students of Scripture, learning more about Hashem, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Okay. So this might be an eternal study for you, huh? Oh, it surely is. It's <laughs> the eternal God and eternal message and yes. eternal people. Yes. Okay. So, so to begin the discussion of the Old Testament, the Bible, could you describe to my audience how you perceive the, the creation narrative, what's happening? Like we have Genesis 1 as this kind of overall narrative, and then we talk uh, the Bible speaks specifically of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Uh, can you fill us in on how you, how you perceive these details? What's the Jewish context here? So the Jewish context is to know that God is sovereign and he brought the world into existence ex nihilo from nothing. He's the creator. He's eternal. He has no beginning, no end. 
He's omnipotent and omniscient. He's all-powerful, and he's all-knowing. Now, people may say, well, this is a very grand view of God, but actually it is this precisely that tells us about his nature. In Jewish thinking, there is nothing you or I have that God needs. There is nothing we can offer him that he lacks. God did not need this world. Which leads us to the question, then, why did God go out of his way to create this world and create man in his image? Yes. Why did he do that? Yes. So that tells us about his character. Given that there is nothing we can give him that he doesn't possess, he didn't create this world because he was lonely. <laughs> he was doing just perfectly without us. So therefore, he could have only created this world out of a complete altruistic act of love, which tells us about his nature. Yes. He is all loving, and he's all merciful. And you and I might wonder, maybe I'm not such a good person. We may wonder, maybe God can't talk to us. Maybe we can't be close to him. So Hashem is saying, Bonim atem Hashem Deuteronomy 14, verse 1, you are children of the Lord your God. So God's oneness is very important. Okay. His singular oneness is critical. Why is the monotheism so critical? Monotheism means not just one, because that's henotheism, but only God. Why is that so important? Here always the Lord is, the Lord is one. Why is this, so, is this a, a numerate issue? Is this a number thing? Like don't get the number wrong? But why does that matter? I understand, like, you want to know, is there one God or five God? Why does it matter? And it, we also seem to, we can figure out that if you're wrong about the oneness of God, it really doesn't make a difference if you're worshiping four gods or eight gods. It's one or it's a complete mess. Wow. Yeah. Whenever there's more than one deity, more than one sovereignty— so in all those religions, the gods are limited. I lived in the Far East serving as rabbi, and I saw people of different religions. Many of them had all sorts of statues. One statue people had for to make a good living. Another statue for your wife to get my my wife should get pregnant. Another statue that I they had gods for everything, but the gods essentially were transactional, which means the god needs something, and then we do something to satisfy the gods, and in exchange they they give us yeah. something. It's almost like going to the store and buying something. When you go into the you go into a store, you buy something. The cashier doesn't ask you the food you're eating is a kosher. So because there's one God, that means that there, he's, he's omnipotent, he's all-powerful, and therefore he must be love, and he must be all mercy and kindliness. And when we deny the unity of God, the absolute radical unity of God, we're denying the nature of God. Yes. And then we could start worshiping Mary. That's what happens. Yeah. So then you start yeah. worshiping Mary, and then you start worshiping the saints. Why is this... The, this Trinitarian belief so compatible with saint worship uh -huh. because that's what happens. It means the Father is too remote. We can't yes. be intimate with him, and we need an intercessor, an intermediary. All this is hostile to Judaism. So that's what the Jew sees. I, I want to change what I just said. That's what the child of God sees in creation. Hashem is love, and he's one alone. The goodness, God has created creating out of his goodness, out of yes. his pure. Oh. So we think of God as someone who is very, very pure, like pure beyond our imagination, who is acting out of love to create. And could, is it fair to say that God is expecting us to recognize him for who he is and to respond to his goodness, to his love? Yes. When we are loyal to God, what we're doing is we're doing the same thing as the person you love when she says to you, I love you, so she's hoping to hear, I love you too. Yes. When Hashem created the world, that's him saying, I love you. Mm -hmm. When we are loyal to him, when we reach out to him through scripture, 
So we are responding to his act of love and creation, and we're saying, I love you too. And if you think this sounds like so romantic or I'm somehow want to, this is exactly how the book of Song of Songs opens. Yishikeni menashikais piyu ki toivim doidecha miyoyin. Kiss me with the kisses of thy lips, for thy love is better than wine. It's a deep, intimate relationship, and that's why idolatry is so vulgar, because idolatry means that you're married to God, but you're you're getting a text message from somebody. Why? Why are you sending your ex-girlfriend birthday cards? We've been married for four years. That's why it's such an assault on. The, that's why idolatry is such an assault on the relationship because there's an intimacy that's been damaged, that's been injured. Now, of course, God has infinite ability to forgive, and he loves us, and he's rooting for us to do better. Yeah, so how do you, how do you frame the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Before we get to the, the sin in the garden, we want to know what was the serpent doing? Why, why did the serpent seek to injure Adam and Eve, like, what was he doing? What was he saying? Like, he seems to pop up right in the beginning of Genesis chapter 3. But we're told some things about the serpent that are very striking. The serpent was the most intelligent of all the beasts. It was, the Bible says, t- tells us that he was the most wise of all the animals. Not only that, but he can walk he can talk, and we can infer from his punishment that he was a connoisseur of good food because his punishment is that everything would taste like dust. So let's think about that for a moment. The serpent, whatever this creature was, was highly intelligent, could walk, could talk, and enjoyed very good food. What does that sound like to you? What kind of qualities are those? It sounds oh, like, like a king, the kind of it? Quali- sounds like someone. It who- sa- well, just to keep it simple, I mean, a king. It, it sounds like it's, these are human qualities. Yes, yes, right? I would say. Walk, talk, highly intelligent, and enjoys good food. Yes. Right? What does that mean? Like, what is happening? Like, so we have to back up to chapter two. We're told a very strange episode immediately before the sin. God brings before Adam all the creatures in the field and to see if any of them are compatible with him, right? Adam was very alone, looking for a helpmate, right? Looking not to be alone. And Adam sees the nature of each of the animals and names them according to that character. But behold, alas, In the language of the King James, Adam realized he wasn't compatible with anyone. That is the event that's the precursor to the sin. What is going on there? I mean, was there really a possibility that Adam could have found a wife in a hippopotamus or a giraffe? Was this really a possibility? It it seems almost like a charade. Like, why do that? I mean, all other animals, they were created immediately, male and female. Like, why is Adam created alone? And did God really bring a rhinoceros? And Adam named it, and then, but I don't think that'll make a good wife. What is happening there? So now we can kind of figure out what happened in the garden. Of all the creatures, all the animals in the world, which one, if it was kind of the dating game, Which one, which creature might have had the best shot with Adam? It would be the creature that was highly intelligent, can walk and talk and enjoy good food. This is the creature that was the one who was thrown out, that was most rejected, not the rhinoceros. And what the creature wanted to do is to shatter that relationship of Adam and Eve and destroy them because he couldn't have what he wanted. And as it turns out, that was ultimately the punishment that the descendants of Eve would despise and detest the serpent. The serpent could no longer walk and it would no longer enjoy food, but rather everything would taste like dust. And now, what was the serpent trying to sell Eve? It seemed the conversation at the beginning of chapter 3, 
almost seems outrageous. Like, what was the serpent trying to convince her of? He was essentially con- trying to convince her that we in the animal world, we don't do what God said. Because Eve is saying, God said that we'll die if we even touch the fruit. What was the argument that the serpent was making? It doesn't seem coherent. But God said, so what? What does that matter? What is, what is the difference then between an animal and a human being? If you had an animal theoretically today who can walk, talk, and, and was highly intelligent and enjoy good food, perhaps that animal should have human rights. But what then is the difference between a human and, a, and an animal? The animal doesn't, ha- doesn't listen to God. No animal ever believed in God because no animal is created in the image of God. None of them do. Animals act upon instincts, and humans have secondary thinking. We also have an ear for God. We're creating the image of God. It's not an accident that 95% of the people who live on our planet believe in a higher power. So the fight really was what guides you, your instincts. That's what animals do, right? Your dog, your cat, they just want to eat. That's what's real. That's the subtext in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. Okay, so you have... A snake who sees the tree, it's good fruit, he's got nothing holding him back from partaking of it. And is he speak no. is that correct? So he's speaking to Eve that she should take on right. like she should be like an animal and partake of this tree? And act on instinct. Remember Eve instinct. saw the fruit uh-huh. and she it looked like it was tasty. Okay. Look, look at the words that's using there. As it turns out, there's nothing in the Torah even that says that they're not allowed to touch it. It was just not allowed to eat it. But she looked upon the fruit and she saw that it was it it was delicious. Okay. Right. So the the serpents the serpents argument was, go for your feelings. I see. Like when you if you have a, I don't know if you have a dog or not, but if you put a steak on the table, <laughs> right? The dog is no idiot. Okay. So the dog is gonna if. If you don't train the dog, it'll jump on the table and take the hamburger yeah. and run off with it, yes. right? The, the dog doesn't care unless you train the dog. So the animal just takes the food. The bear okay. just takes the food. There's okay. no voice of God. We have a voice of God. All right, so, so Eve had a, had a compete. Now, she was offered either to go according to her instincts or to be in right. obedience to God. Is that, that right. the choice that she had to make now? Very much so. And, and to so, be an animal, to be human. Right. So Adam was given dominion over God's creation, over the beasts. Right? Yes. So, mm-hmm. so I, I guess the error here is like Adam and Eve should rather have demonstrated their dominion over the the advice. Like we've got dominion over you. You're not going to tell us what to do. But in, right. instead, they chose to listen to the advice of this beast rather than listen to the voice of God. Hmm. And that's, that's exactly. what you're saying, that this is actually what created right. the fall. Right. And, uh, and this God... is, now, we, we don't use the term fall. That's really a, okay. very much a Christian term. Okay. But that's what caused this sin that really did change the world in so many ways, absolutely. Okay, so what's the, what kind of terminology do you use for this? I'll tell you the distinction the distinction is that in Christian view, that sin infected mankind to the extent that man could do nothing, no effort or initiative of man can save him. That man essentially is a sinful creature, and we've inherited this sin. And then in Christian view, the only way you can be saved is through the cross. In the Jewish view, that's not the case at all, and that man can do it. God created you in his image, and a It was a fellow named Job, who wasn't Jewish, the oldest book in Tanakh, who managed through his obedience to God, he was tempted. His life was falling apart. So that's why, because these terms are very meaningful to both the Jew and the Christian. Can you repent and will God forgive you or not? So that's where the difference falls. So so Adam and Eve were put out of the garden, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean in your in your thinking? What does it mean to be put out from the Garden of Eden? Is it loss of communion with, communion with God? They, they lost their connection with the Most High? We're given the answer to that question very clearly 
We're told in Genesis 2 that there are actually two very striking trees in the garden, not one. One of them is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but the second one, a tree of life. Notice, however, at that early stage, there was no prohibition to eat from the tree of life. Man would have lived forever if not for that sin. So eating from the tree of life prior to the sin in the pre-sin world uh, would have been redundant because man was, in any case, living forever. Death didn't enter the world. Follow? Look very carefully at Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. Suddenly, now that Adam has been cursed in that, death has entered the world, meaning a person will die. Man becomes mortal. That's what the word literally means. So now there becomes an imperative that man does not eat from the tree of life. And notice that God turns to angels and says, guard the garden. They have to be out lest they eat from the tree of life. Oh, why is this a problem? And if eating from the tree of life is in fact creates a conundrum, it was catastrophic, then why not warn them to begin with? No, in Genesis 2, it didn't matter. It now matters a lot. They can't eat from the tree of life lest they be like angels, like completely divine. So we know exactly why they were taken out of the Garden of Eden. Man is put out of the Garden of Eden. Yeah. He's now become mortal. Right. So what is man supposed to do now? We're told immediately, the very next chapter, God has a conversation with Cain. One follows the next. Man and the serpent will forever be at odds with each other. As a child, I remember going to the zoo and looking at the reptile house in shock and disgust and something about snakes made me very uncomfortable. And it remains that way to this day. But God tells Cain, let me explain to you what exactly is going to happen here. As it turns out, sin is hiding behind the door. And you are the object of its desire. And remember now the serpent has no feet. In a sense, it can grab you at the foot where you don't have, you may not see it coming. It wants to destroy you, wants to bring sin into your life, but you can master over him. Genesis chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. So God is telling us that we have complete free will. I place life and death, good and evil, choose life. Yes. Okay, beautiful. Wow. I've never heard it put quite that way. So, so Cain has power over his actions, but right. he's, he's not going to allow that authority that God gave him to win out against his carnal instincts of anger and whatever whatever's coming out from him. Well, Cain gonna, failed in that sense. Cain failed, he, yes. That means there's a balance. It's free will. You have never sinned in your life unless you had a choice not to. So it's complete free will. Cain is going to become envious of his brother, and that was his failure. There will be other people like Abraham who would be a nor very successful and will be loyal to God. And the book of Genesis very much is, first of all, it's my family album. It's a story about the children of Israel, the birth of the children of Israel. But the story about people who would succeed and people who would fail. Okay. So, what, so, so when Cain commits the first murder, this is something that is fresh, like something coming to the world that's never happened before. A mm. human being taking the life of another. Right. So what does this precedent mean for humanity? Like, it, is, it, is it that like the first time something is done now, it, it sets a pattern for human behavior in the future? No, because if it had, then Abraham would never be able to achieve the heights that he, that God said he did. Abraham was loyal to God and kept all of his commandments and kept all of his laws. So we have in view throughout Genesis, people who succeeded and people who failed. So Cain failed, Abraham succeeded. Asa failed, 
Isaac succeeded. It's all about people who would have free will and people would uh, choose to be a loyal member of the Third Reich. And then there would be this very unusual personality, Oskar Schindler, a German, Roman Catholic, a womanizer, who in the midst of all that became faithful to God and did the right thing. So it's all about people who under the same circumstances choose one direction or the other, and that's what comes into view until this day, free will. So man, where is it written in Ezekiel where God is speaking through the prophet? He asks Israel, why will you die, O house of Israel? <laughs> and he talks about like the righteous man will not, you know, he talks about the wicked man. He makes Ezekiel a watchman and he's to warn the wicked uh, from their ways. And if the wicked turn from their ways, they will be, they will come to life. I would hope that everyone who believes in Reformed theology will consider the words of God. He says, is, God says, is it my desire at all that the wicked should perish? It is not rather that they turn from their sinful ways that they might live. And if the wicked person turns away from his sins, none of his transgressions will be remembered against him. What a, what a powerful message. And Ezekiel is giving this message when the temple is destroyed. So Ezekiel is, understands how people may not, not recognize how much God is ready to forgive, but just turn back to God, right? Right. So, there's, so God is always calling for a return. Oh. Return back to him. And so, okay, so now that we kind of got this framework established, can you speak a little bit about your view of the messianic age, like, is there some, this, this, an age where things will be made right again? So what is this, what is this in your view? How, how will God make all things right? What does this look like? It's a world in which sin will be obviously bad. It's a world where the book of Habakkuk tells us that the knowledge of God will fill the world as the water covers the sea. Isaiah echoes that sentiment in chapter 11, verse 9. The role of the Messiah is to rebuke the nations. He's not supposed to be going around doing miracles. He might, but that's not what's conveyed in the Hebrew Bible. He's a person who will give hechacha, which rebuke to the nations, and the nations will take heed and as a result of that, they will flow like a river up to Jerusalem, for out of Zion will go forth the law and the word of God from Jerusalem. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn of war anymore. The nation of Israel will be gathered back to the land of Israel. And although nations sought to destroy us, God will destroy all the enemies of his enemies, all the enemies of God. A temple will be built in Jerusalem. It'll be a place not just for Jews, but for Jew and non-Jew, together serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The full restoration of the sacrificial system restored. We have the unused blueprints of the final messianic third temple in the last nine chapters of the book of Ezekiel. All this will be launched and announced by Elijah the prophet, who we're told the very end of the book of Malachi, the prophetic sec section of the Hebrew Bible, that he will announce this restoration of the world. And people will listen, people will take heed. In fact, the sovereignty of the king, this Davidic king from the line of David, that will be so great that all nations will listen to him, heed him, even from river to see even to the end of the world, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10. And I, I think we are living in a time now that we're very close to this period. All the events that lead up to this are now, everything's in place. So what does the term Messiah mean, literally? What is the definition? It means anointed. So it's, it's not a very special word in Tanakh. It means that when somebody was set aside for a leadership position, oil was poured on his head. That's all it means. And as it turns out, that word appears 39 times in the Hebrew Bible. And what is striking is it's never used about the Messiah. 
Now, we use the word the Messiah. We know, you and I know exactly who we're talking about. We're talking about the final successor of the Davidic house. But in Tanakh, that term wasn't could refer to any person, Jew or not Jewish, who had an assignment to carry out uh, the will of Hashem, either knowingly or in the case of Cyrus, someone who really who understood that he was doing what God wanted, but he was not certainly not a monotheist, and he's called God's Mashiach. So it's used very widely in the Hebrew Bible, and it appears more frequently in the book of Leviticus applied to priests from the house of Aaron. Okay, so given this, what, like, where is the Messiah, if I can use that term, like the this special anointed one, where is that referenced? Or how, how do you, how do you, are you associating prophecy with this, like say special, singular, singularly important Messiah? Or are there other terms that you can use to describe right. Messiah? So in Tanakh, let's just for a moment say there are hundreds of passages that are messianic in the Hebrew Bible. I'm sure. I never counted it up. There are actually very, very few about the Messiah himself. Very few. You can probably count it up on your two hands. That's it. What comes into view in the Hebrew Bible is how the world will be changed. The Messiah himself is spoken of very famously in Isaiah chapter 11, where we're told that he is from the root of Jesse. He's the descendant of King David. He's also a descendant of King Solomon, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 16, the Davidic covenant. Um, he is somebody who God will imbue him with wisdom and understanding. He will not judge people after the sight of his eyes. Remember, it will be a full theocracy when Mashiach comes. When Mashiach comes, there'll be a now the question, why, why isn't theocracy a good idea today? Because you can't trust anyone. That's why democracy is the second best system. Because you hope that <laughs> there's a consensus and the consensus of what the people want. Hopefully the majority are, you know, it's, we know that doesn't work. We, we know that doesn't work, but that's why it's the, the, the least worst form of government. But if you have somebody who the spirit of Hashem is upon him, and it's someone who fears God, Isaiah 11, verse 2 and 3. And I encourage all Trinitarians to think about that. The Mashiach is going to fear the Almighty. So this is a person who could really sit in the throne of David and who can judge people, not because, look, the side of his eyes, oh, it's very, he's very handsome, she's very pretty. This is all silly idolatry. All the nations, they, they worship actors and TV stars and all this all foolish. Why? Because they, the only thing they have in common is they're somehow attractive. That's it. So, I mean, but really he's a person who will judge people according to the spirit that the Almighty plays upon him. So he will be, in a sense, not just the chief rabbi of the Jews, but the chief rabbi of the world. The whole world will serve him as a Davidic king, as the successor of the promise that was made to King David, his great-great-grandfather 3,000 years ago. Yeah, I was just thinking about the promise that was made to David, that God is promising David a kingdom that will last forever. Right. And yet, there was an end to, there was an end to the kings that sat upon the throne there in Jerusalem after the exile in Babylon. So is this Messiah, like, picking up, like, that place that was vacant for 2,500 years or so? Right. And is his kingdom an eternal kingdom? Right. So the, how is, I mean, how does this fit? It's, it's, it seems like, like to most people, this would seem rather strange. I mean, that David's kingdom would last forever. Well, you know, the question may be asked, well, where is David's kingdom, right? <laughs> Though the Jews have returned. I, I was actually in Jerusalem at the place where David's palace was. Very interesting. Oh, in the city of David. And, uh, yeah, city of David, yes. So how, how could you explain to the audience... Uh, so how this there are two ways this could be understood and very frequently people 
assume one way of mission. So there are two ways to view the Davidic kingdom that it will be forever, will, would never be removed. Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, that this is obviously an allusion to the Messiah. So one way to view that is that there would always be a Davidic king at all times. That means once it's launched, it means Saul's kingdom came to an end. David was already anointed by Samuel. And at that point, from that point that David became king, so there would never be any epic, any time in history where there would not be a Davidic king sitting on the throne of David. That's one way to view it. But that way to view it, of course, is very problematic. It's problematic also for Christians. The reason is, is that we know very much that the end of the first temple marked the end of the reign of, of Tzidkiah, of Zedekiah, and he was carried to Bovel. So there was certainly no Davidic kings during the Second Temple. There were people who should have never been called themselves kings like the Maccabees did. Herod wasn't really Jewish. He was an Edomite. But regardless, so that's not what it means. So what it means is whenever there would be a king, a legitimate king, it would always be from the house of David. It would never be from any other family or any other tribe. And the Davidic king has promised that what happened to Saul, who was from a Divan tribe, that it was taken away from him utterly and completely, that will never happen to David. And whenever there would be a legitimate king, that would be from David and from Solomon. And so it is continuing. That's what Mashiach is. So it's not that there wouldn't be a pause. In fact, we're told explicitly in Hosea chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, we're given a capsule of all this, where the Almighty says that, in fact, the children of Israel will abide for many days, and they will not have a king. They will have no prince. They will have no sacrificial system. None of these, the AFO, the, the high, none of that. That means the last segment of Jewish history before Mashiach will be a period, and it's very long, many days, without any of those things, until when? Verse 5, until finally Israel will return to Lord their God and to David their king, and they will come trembling to the Almighty in the end of days or in the final days. That's clearly Mashiach. So, in fact, Hosea is telling us that the last part of Jewish history before the Messiah is where there'll be no king, there'll be no high priest. This is an issue that Christians have to solve because in Christian theology, we have a king, and that's Christ. We have, right, we have INRI, right, that the Christ is our king and he's our high priest, Hebrews chapter 5, 6, 7, 8. So I'm not a Christian, so but Christians have to solve this. And, you know, that, you know, but if in Jewish thought, this is perfect. Yeah, I've thought through those things. But, uh, you know, we're, I, I really appreciate you filling us in here. So when you talk about Israel, it sounds like you're talking about Israel having some kind of a return, repentance, Right. Towards their God, this is what initiates Messiah's reign? Yes, or? yes. that's the big trigger. Okay. Isaiah okay. 59, verse 20. Uvo letzion goel, leshave feshave Yaakov. And a redeemer will be, I'm just translating my head, a redeemer will return to Zion to those in Jacob who have repented. This is a very important passage. So the children of Israel must repent. doesn't mean every Jew. It doesn't mean George Soros. I mean, I hope he does repent. I wish him the best in his life. But it doesn't mean the, the senator from Vermont. doesn't mean him. Doesn't, I hope that he does okay. turn to Hashem. But the, <laughs> the, it doesn't mean Bobby Fischer. He definitely did not turn to God. He was a Jew. doesn't mean Christopher no, 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 no. Hitchens. He was a, a good chess player. He was a good chess player. Anyhow. He was a great chess player. Christopher right. Hitchens didn't. But it means that yeah, the... Yeah return, repentance of the Jew triggers the coming of Mashiach. This verse is quoted or misquoted in Romans. See, in th Christian theology, this is a little bit problematic because in, in, especially in Pauline theology, there's nothing that anyone could do to achieve their own salvation. There's no initial man is sinful. 
So in Romans, he quotes that the Redeemer will come and he will turn back the hearts of Jacob. So that's not what the text says. Originally, the text in Isaiah 59 verse 20 is that the Redeemer will come to those in Zion who repent. That's taken from Isaiah. That portion portion is taken. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, so the... Well, I guess I'm curious to ask, like, the role, the role of Messiah is not to cause Israel to repent. Like, there isn't, Messiah is not acting in a way to, like, turn the hearts of Israel right. back to their God. Right. But this is an initiative that Israel has to take on their own in order for Messiah to appear. Right. That's exactly correct. Is that how you see yes. it? Yes. Well, the text says, Uvo Lutzion Goel. And a redeemer will come to Zion, the Shave Fesh of Yaakov, to those in Jacob who have repented. So the text is very clear that he's coming to a people that have repented, and that triggers the coming of Mashiach. It's very clear. So do you have any anticipation how this might look, like the coming of Messiah? Is he going to appear on the scene or like out of nowhere or is he so that's well, that would be a nightmare if he came out of nowhere because if he came okay. out of nowhere people wouldn't have a chance to repent and that's why like why did god use 10 plagues like one wasn't enough why is this whole order of events that are unfolding and i believe they're happening now the nation of israel not all but more than half of the jews live in the land of israel today uh, it's, uh, we're living in a very different world than 100 years ago. We almost certainly passed Jacob's trouble from Jer- Jeremiah 30, the, the great tribulation of the Holocaust. W- I hope so. Why? I pray that. Well, it, there's nothing could be worse than that. So that that ha- no. nothing. And Jeremiah says there's a day coming. And for you, the viewer who's watching this, Jeremiah lived during pretty bad times. So when Jeremiah is looking to the yes, future and saying there's a day coming, there'll be nothing as bad as that. This is not the destruction of the first temple. We now know yes. uh, all of European Jewry destroyed the bloodiest war in human history, the most evil. Yeah. Uh, war in human history. So uh, it's very important that people repent. This is not um, like color war, and hopefully you're on the right team. So therefore, Hashem is, is each event follows the next event. We see the return of the children of Israel to their land, to our ancestral land. I mean, we're the people of this land. We are not... Um, the British in the Falkland Islands, or we're not the Dutch in Indonesia, which have they have no historical relationship to these. These this is not Belgium in the Congo. This is the restoration, the promise of the same chapter, Jeremiah 30, verse three. You're going to return. You're going to come back. And now it's up to people to say, "Whoa, something is happening here. The Jews are returning from the ashes of Auschwitz, and they're returning." back to the land, and Jerusalem now is the center of the world. And so it's very important this happens. There are so many people around the world who are observing these events and are saying, the God of Israel is working here. I feel that we are living in a unique time. This 100 years ago, oh, 100 years ago, we would have said, this is completely ridiculous. You're dreaming. Wake up. So why is Hashem doing it this way? Why not like you say, have suddenly just blast the trumpets in Zion because no one would have a chance to do tshuva. No one would have a chance to repent. And now we're seeing a mass repentance in the world, not all the world, but people are turning to Hashem. Right before, so there's a mass repentance today, like hasn't been for really since biblical times. And the result of that is going to trigger the coming of Mashiach. There will be Elijah the prophet will announce this immediately prior to the coming of Mashiach. The world will change their behavior, not all. Some, unfortunately, will be destroyed. It's my prayer, and I'm sure it's yours, that the world will repent, that people will come to the God of Israel, but the enemies of God will be destroyed. Zechariah 8, Zechariah 12, Ezekiel 38, 39, Zechariah 14. It's really quite all over the place. And then the Mashiach will come, 
but he will come to a nation that has repented and the world's nations will look to the Jews and say, teach us about God. They'll be shocked, but they will say, now we know that God is with you. kishamanu, because we have heard that God is with you, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23, and the nations will go by your light. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, arise and shine. It's very powerful what's happening. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So, touching upon, you, you talked a little bit about the role of Messiah rebuking the nations. Mm. And is there also administration of justice in, in your view? Like, like the nations who... Those that refuse to serve God, you know, in the Christian, in typical Orthodox Christianity, you have a heaven and hell situation going on where, you know, those who don't obey God mm. suffer hell fire for eternity and somehow God, they think God runs a torture chamber for eternity. <laughs> So, and and, the, the, and those that, that are righteous go to heaven. But what you're talking, I mean, how how does how does this like how does this work in the Jewish framework? Like, judgment is destruction and death. It's consummation, and serving God is life. Like, it's. Can you describe this a little sure. bit? We're here to to connect with God properly and to reject all other faiths or unbelief. At the end of days, we're told that ultimately many will come to the God of Israel, but some will not. We're told in a kind of interesting way in Zechariah that two parts will be destroyed, but there will be a third part that will be saved. In Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, 8. Um, and, and, and they will be utterly destroyed, as described in Ezekiel chapter 38 and chapter 39. So it's very much happening here. And I'll tell you like I'll tell you like this, Tom. You know, I'm not God's manager. I'm a salesman. So m our job is to bring about the repentance of the world. That's the role of the Jew, to be a light to the nations. Whatever this destruction is, it's, it's not a good thing. And I don't want it for anyone. I want people to come to the God of Israel to serve him alone and serve no other God. But the destruction that, that comes into view for those who are enemies of God it will be absolute. What can you say about resurrection? We talked about this a little bit on the side. So can you describe to the audience what resurrection means in the Jewish mind? Sure. The spiritual. The full resurrection of the dead is only for those who are faithful, for those who are loyal. Although it appears that people who are wicked too will return, only for so that the world will see their contempt that comes into view in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. There are very few passages in the Hebrew Bible that make any mention of the afterlife. For those of you who are not studying Scripture carefully, so you will find very few passages that ever discuss what happens after you die. And it's because you, you can't repent once you die, and, it's in, and God threatens us for sure, but he doesn't threaten us with going to hell. That's never a threat in Tanakh because you can't check it out. You can't test it. It's unfalsifiable. It's a very silly claim because it, now God will say it's going to stop raining. And he said, does say you're going to go into exile. And he does say that your crops will stop growing. And the reason why God speaks that way is because we can very much – we can very much check the weather, and we can very much see if we're hungry or not, but we can't see what happens after you die. So this is, uh, this is in Tanakh, it is mentioned, the resurrection, but what, what's happening there is that people who have succeeded in, in living their lives loyal to the God of Israel, so we have, we know that our DNA is 
the same as your dog, I mean, 98%. The difference is that we're created in the image of God and we're tasked with being loyal to him and we have complete free will. You know, imagine a, an oak tree. You chop it down and you, you make a barrel from the wood. Oak doesn't really have much of an odor. It does. But if you fill that barrel with wine, if you fill it with fragrant oils, so even after you pour out the wine, even after you pour out the perfume, the wood then has absorbed, has become imbued with the quality, with the fragrance, with the, with the taste of the wine. That's very much what could happen for you, what could happen for you, the viewer. And that is that if he, our physical bodies are animal, right? But God breathed into us a divine spark. Whatever that means, we are, every human being is created in the image of God. If we, during our lifetime, are successful in being loyal to God and therefore raising our bodies up, so our bodies become an instrument of service to God, so the res our bodies resurrect. Why? Why do we need a physical resurrection? Most people, I think, view the physical resurrection as a as a reward. Because death, the reason why death is so horrifying for people is that there's essentially people view it as there's a party, which we're all at, and that at some point during the party, you get tapped on the shoulder and you're told that you have to leave. And worse, the party goes on without you. And that's a nightmare, right? So that's what people are petrified of, that you have to leave and the party keeps going. Just people keep going and having a good time and you're out. So people, I think, view the resurrection as you get to come back to the party. So this is just temporary. The resurrection is the necessity, is the result of being faithful to God. When Look at the Torah. Look at the commandments. They're very physical. Eat only kosher, make a blessing on it, raise it up, bring it as an offering, give charity, feed the hungry, take care of the widow, the orphan, keep the Shabbat, keep the... Ha Why is this such a physical thing? Why aren't we like Buddhists who just sit and meditate all day? No, there's all this activity in service to God because what's happening during our lifetime, if we're successful like... Uh, people like Yotam, a great king of Israel, like Abraham, a great patriarch of Israel. If we're successful, so then our physical body becomes filled with the fragrance of the oil, fragrance of the wine. And therefore, the resurrection becomes a necessity because the body is now holy. And that's why the bones are, are preserved. You know, bones, they they thousands of years. Why does God do that? Why are the bones preserved? Well, we know from Ezekiel 37, I'm not guessing this, Ezekiel 37 Ezekiel sees a resurrection. It's not the resurrection. It's a resurrection for him to see, to know that Israel will be restored, the valley of dry bones. So it is the bones that God preserves. That's why it's forbidden. Don't No one should ever get cremated because what they do, you know, the bone, the calcium doesn't permit the bone to be destroyed by the fire. So they actually grind up the bones. It's a very violent thing to do. And I, very, people don't know this. So, Never, never, ever get cremated and never honor a request for cremation. People don't know any better. But in reality, God is preserving the bones for the resurrection. We now have a better understanding of science, and we now can understand that from any part of the body, the bone included, the entire body could be reconstituted and will be in during the resurrection. So the resurrection is a testimony that this body has devoted its itself to the God of Israel. You're raising the physical into the spiritual. That's what really we're all doing. We're taking the physical world around us. We're saying, this woman, I'm going to take her as a wife, and we're going to be together. We're going to bring children to the world. But only this, this is not my wife, not somebody else's wife. And therefore, we become partners with God in creation. There's a very holy thing. So we take an act of a physical act, but we make it, we make sure it's intimate and it's reserved only for this woman, only for this man, and then we become partners with God in creation. What are we really doing there? We're taking a physical act and we're raising it up to the spiritual. Those people who are successful at applying this principle will resurrect from the dead, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. So it makes sense that God 
would would bring into the age to come those that were serving him in this life already. Right. That makes right. good sense. Right. So God is God is gathering together his faithful people to be able to serve him in that in that age. Right. I guess it's simply yeah. put, right? Okay. That's so beautifully said. Um, okay, so what what I'm trying to think what other topic I wanted, I was interested for you to address. You know, it still intrigues me. Okay, so can you talk, again, to go back to the role of Messiah, like, is he doing anything besides rebuking the nations? Like, is he, he's reigning, you see him as reigning from Jerusalem. Reigning from Jerusalem. He's king over Israel. He's, he has each, he possesses eternal life. Like, does this Messiah possess eternal life without the necessity of resurrection? Because he's so faithful to God? Is he like uh, another Enoch? Or um, how, how, does, how does this how does The Bible this doesn't tell us. Doesn't it's just the Bible is silent on this matter. Because of Ezekiel 46, verse 16, 17, where... The Messiah is spoken of as the prince, as the Nossi, and his his inheritance to his children is a sign there. So perhaps one can infer that there's a passing along, but we have to be careful to be sensitive to the issues that God is sensitive to. If Tanakh does, Tanakh is interested in telling you this, here's what he's going to do. V'shafat bein ha'goyim. He will judge among the nations. And rebuke many peoples. That's what you need to know. And the way he's going to judge people is because the spirit of Hashem that we place in them. Tanakh doesn't go into anything else. So he will be like David. If you want a picture of the Messiah, he'll be something like David. He's even called David throughout Tanakh. But he's a teacher. Um, it's it's a little different than the way Jesus appears in the Gospels as a person who's doing miracles a lot. Um, it's he's a teacher. He's a person who will bring the knowledge of God uh, and teach people and judge people. That's it. Okay. So the the uh, the term the term uh, made in the image of God. We were discussing from Genesis chapter two, mm -hmm. correct? So. Is Messiah Mashiach? Is he? Is he imaging God? Like, is he? Is he the idealized human being who is actually showing us what it is to be perfect, to be sinless, to be faithful to God? Like, is he? Is he set apart and unique in this in this way, like none other? So the Messiah is not sinless. In fact, the Messiah himself is going to bring a sin offering on behalf of his own sins and the sins of the people. And Ezekiel 45, verse 20 and 22. Now, he's a very good man. He's a very great man. And whatever sins that he's bringing an offering for, the Bible tells us that are for unintentional sins, sins that are committed out of ignorance or unintended. He's not a, he doesn't rebel against God. There are people in Tanakh who really are loyal to God completely. Abraham and Genesis, we are told, was completely loyal to God and kept all of God's commands. I know the Messiah himself is not um, a greater servant of God than Abraham was, but we can distinguish the Messiah from Abraham in a different way. Whereas Abraham transformed souls in Choron, and he was able to bring about ultimately through his children and grandchildren a great nation, but still the Messiah's teaching is going to bring about the transformation of the world, meaning the world is going to do tshuva. Maybe I'll add in that Moses, a great redeemer, 
but he, he really brought about the redemption of a single nation, the children of Israel from Egypt, not the rest of the world. The advent of the Messianic age is the redemption of the whole world. All the world will know about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what's emphasized, that the knowledge of God will cover the world as the water covers the sea. All nations will serve him, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. It will not be like in other times where, of course, there are some people who are loyal to God, but many who are not. In the Messianic age, everyone will be loyal to God and to David, meaning the Messiah, his servant. Okay. So you compared Messiah to Moses. You compared him to Abraham. Oh. And I guess indirectly you compared him to David. Well, the Bible calls him David in Ezekiel chapter 37, mm -hmm. verse 24 and 25, the Messiah, the Prince. He, his name is David in tonight. Yes. I mean, this is not like you're not listening to the ranting of some odd rabbi living in Jerusalem. This is very explicit. The Messiah is called David, as we saw before, Hosea chapter 3, verse 5, Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 24 and 25. He's called David explicitly. Now, I think that Christians and Jews could have a consensus that he, his name may not be David. That's fine. But what I think that, you know, Christians and Jews can differ on so many things, but I think what we can agree on is that David did some marvelous things in his life. He was an extraordinary man. And also the Messiah is the fulfillment of promise that made to David, and that's what should trigger our attention in this. But he's called David in Tanakh. Can I, can I ask you a question that's maybe a little bit off sure. to the side here? It has to do with David numbering the people. Mm. And 70,000 in Israel right. died. What happened there? Like, what was, was it David's sin to number the people? Or was it that, was David actually taking a census for uh, a temple tax and the people were obligated to pay? Like how, I, I know this is a little bit of a question off the side, but is David, because David confesses, or David tries to lay blame upon himself afterwards. He's saying, he calls him, he says, Lord, what have these people done? Let your sin, or let, 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 let me receive the punishment, not, not these, not right. my people. So what, how, how, what's happening in the, in this scene, uh, in your, in your view? So as it turns out, the information is supplied to us in two very strange passages, which must be set side by side. One is in Second Samuel chapter 24, verse one. And the other is First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, which is very interesting because this is describing the same event. What's very interesting is that in Second Samuel, it's very important to see these side by side because if you don't, it'll blow your, if you don't, it'll blow your mind away. So in Second Samuel 24, we're told that God is very angry at the Jewish people and he's going to punish them for their disloyalty. But God always works through a method. We know from the Torah is forbidden to count the people. And that's why the people had, there was a device. How do you do a census? So people had to give a, a certain amount of currency, each one not more, not less, whether he's rich or poor, and they counted the currency. But counting people, so this is very important, what is, like, what's going on here? So you, we don't count people. We rather count a coin, a machetes a shekel. We count a coin. We never count the people because that places a finite number on them. So now we know what's happening. So if you look at Second Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, the Torah says that Hashem was angry at the people of Israel and he triggered David to counting the people. Let's slide over to First Chronicles 21, verse 1. And this will shock people where it says there, Vayamoid Satan al Yisrael, that Satan went against Israel, stood up against Israel and caused David to count to number the people. So you see here that Satan is doing the will of God. So this is not really a contradiction, but this is like, this is, wow, there's so much powerful information that sudden is an, is an agent of God. God orders Satan 
go seduce David and do something he should not be doing. Why? Because I'm very angry at them. And we know from the Torah that we're not allowed to count people. That triggers a nightmare, a disaster. But that's what Hashem was doing. But you see here something intriguing. So we know that there is judgment, but we see that God works through the world around us. It means why couldn't God just do it? Because he had to work through a system that works. The nation had to behave in a way that was that ultimately put them in jeopardy. So what the text actually is very explicit in these cases and also tells us a lot about Satan, which is intriguing because Satan is very rarely mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, very rare. So, th- so therefore, right, so any mention of Satan is therefore very valuable in that it tells us about what who is Satan, what his nature is, because this is we, with literally just a handful of verses about Satan. So this is very important. So David was David was kind of enticed literally. to number like yes. to number the people. Okay, so so what can you say about David's attitude of taking the blame for what just happened? And offering the sacrifice, like the biblical account shows that there is this angel with a sword drawn, if I remember, standing over the house of Ornan the Jebusite. And David could see this, right? Mm -hmm. And David goes to this place where this angel of death has just passed through Israel and killed 70,000. And he's going to offer a sacrifice in that place. That must have been terrifying. Well, I, I would imagine so. I, what do you think? I would agree. It was, it was a time of tremendous tribulation and great judgment. Absolutely. Yeah. So what does that say about the character of David? That he was willing to take the blame, to put his life in jeopardy, and to offer this sacrifice, which he actually didn't know that it would turn the plague away until I mean, God responded to David and he halted this angel. Yeah. Is that correct? Look, at every stage, what comes into view about David, let's, like, I just want to expand this. David is not perfect. He's very much not perfect. That comes into view much earlier on in the book of Samuel. The, his, even his, I know people are thinking of Bathsheba, but you even think of his interaction with Abigail was not perfect. 100%. He wasn't a perfect person. What was unique about David in the big picture in Tanakh is not that he was perfect or sinless by any stretch of the imagination, but when he was confronted with his sin, he realized it. The mis- and David and Shaul, Saul, are, in Hebrew, we call them the Zvugim. That means they're couples. They're they're match side by side. What was Saul's great mistake? That when he was confronted by Samuel, Saul made excuses. Like, why didn't you kill Amalek? So we have to always, if we want to see what's happening, we need to saturate the photograph. We need to saturate the passages. And the reason why Saul and Samuel are placed right there in in 1 Samuel 15, that they're supposed to be contrasted one against the other. Samuel becomes very saddened, delusioned. He's going to a deep depression. He's completely full. David is able to find it. And David, when he was confronted by the prophet Nathan with the juridical parable, right, after he did something really terrible, just so horrible, most people don't know how bad it was because they don't actually read the text. It was a nightmare what happened with Bathsheba. The key, this is the key of everything, that when Nathan told him a story, it was a, a, not just, it was a juridical parable, David was able to say, I am at chatasi Lashem, I've sinned before the Lord. And that's what Saul could not do. Saul was making excuses. And one could even argue that what David did was much worse than what Saul did. Saul didn't kill out everyone from Amalek. All right, he didn't kill everybody. He say he left Agag, he didn't kill the animals. I don't know, is that like what David did, which seems to be adultery, mass murder, was 
a nightmare, right? So what what is happening here? What is going on with David? What is the what is the feature about David? Uh, so I'm going to say this to you, Tom. We don't know each other, but it's possible that people have hurt you in your life. It's possible, right? And maybe it's someone that you once knew years ago who you're very close to. But betrayal is a very painful thing. If that person had ever come to you and said to you, Tom, I sinned against you. I did a terrible thing, and I so deeply regret what I did. I renounce what I did. I am so sorry. It is possible that you would say, okay, I forgive you. And you would be in a totally different place with that person today. But things are very different because the person did not confess his sin to you. And for those of you in a relationship, in a marriage, the best thing with your spouse to do is say, I did a terrible thing and I'm so sorry. Would you forgive me? What, and it's so likely that if the people who have heard us would just have said, not but, nothing, just say, I sin before you, so that person would forgive you. This is very much, we're creating the image of God. And this is very much what's happening here. What makes David different and what makes the great people different in Torah, in Tanakh, is not that they're sinless, not that they're perfect, but what do you do with your sin? Are you going to behave like Shaul, where you are in denial and making excuses? Or are you going to rise to the level and say, I've sinned, I recognize that I've done a terrible thing here, I'm going to bring an offering. And Nathan, those words is to, to David is, the Lord has already forgiven you. Wow. In the Jewish view, the whole purpose of David, the whole point of that, like what? How did that even happen? The whole purpose is David is teaching us how to repent. People very frequently feel that God will never forgive me. This is what, why don't people repent? Why don't people turn away? Because people deep down think that God will never forgive me. You don't know what I've done. If my wife would ever know some things I've done, she'd throw me out of the house. So, But God knows everything. This is what's really going on. And God knows I've done some terrible things in my life that nobody knows about. right? So we think that, of course, I'll repent. But phew, he's never going to forgive me. You don't know what I've done. When I go, he's getting ready. So what Tanakh is telling us is that Hashem loves you, and if you repent and just recognize that you've sinned and renounce that sin, God will completely forgive you. And David, at every step of the way, is not perfect. That's what He's so imperfect in Tanakh. He is, by the way, David is mentioned more frequently than anyone else in the Hebrew Bible. The name David appears in the Hebrew Scriptures far more than Moses. The key of David is not that he's perfect. The key of David is when he's confronted with sin, he knows exactly what to do at that critical juncture. That's what comes across at every point. And in contrast, the reason why we could have such a great photograph is we're able to saturate it and we're able to bring these colors out, also using his zivug, his the couple in this sense, of Shaul who didn't know how to handle his mistakes and did all the wrong things. That's that's the big takeaway. Yeah, yeah. I. I agree 100 percent that's i've thought i've made that comparison many years ago and i i, I thought yeah. in that sense yes david had the capacity and he had the trust yeah. that this good god of creation the god of israel was capable exactly. of forgiving him right. he had that confidence right. in god and yes i'll just share this with you tom you know like what good is it to have someone who's not capable of sinning not sinning like what's the point like if i were perfect and born perfect, then of course I wouldn't sin. I mean, the whole point is that you really, not not in some nice way, but you really, really were tempted. You're really struggling. You could have gone in any way. Perhaps sometimes you failed and you had to repent to God. That's the whole point. The point is, the point is that you really genuinely are struggling with sin, but you're able to be like David, not that you've never sinned. What makes David stand out is not that he never made a mistake, but what do you do when you're confronted with this sin? Are you ready to repent? That's the, for the Jew, this is the ultimate issue. But many people give up on themselves. Just to mention in my own faith tradition, well, or my own faith experience, I know the God of Israel is capable of forgiving. And I, and I turn to him in repentance and I, you know, I humble myself before him. 
I have my own way of doing it, <laughs> which we're not discussing at this point. But uh, yeah, I, I can mm -hmm. resonate with what yeah. you're saying fully. So let me let me ask. Um, as far as David's, David thought a lot about Messiah, did he not? Like in Psalm number two, isn't David speaking about Messiah? No, in Psalm he's number very two? much speaking about himself in the first person. And he's, it's, it's called an enthronement psalm for a reason. It's God saying to him, he, look, he, David is speaking in the first person, you know, that you are my son. Uh, today I have begotten you. So he's very much talking to King David. It's very important to watch the pronouns. Yeah, David is enthroned in Psalm 2, and that's why David is speaking about himself. It's not a, a future prophecy. Now, one point I think everyone should bear in mind is that, of course, David, as we mentioned earlier, is the beginning of a Davidic covenant, so it's going to continue and uh, David would defeat his enemies, which comes to view in that chapter. But it's not like the enemies of God are destroyed forever. It will continue throughout his descendants. But that's that's a psalm about David, right? So would you say that if it's applying to David in the immediate at the immediate time it was written, that there was a sense of like foreshadowing then coming, like concerning the the lineage of David and the future? I mean, David does see a Messiah coming, does he not? See, we're using a word. The, the, here's where we're getting into trouble. Is, and you are correctly. We all use, Jew and Christian, we're all using word like Messiah. But this is not a biblical term. Meaning the word Messiah is in the Bible. But what we mentioned at the beginning is that Tanakh doesn't use these terms. What David knows is what you and I know. He has a promise. And that is that Although he will have children who might sin, and God says that if you have a child sin, I will punish him with the rod of men, but I will never take away the covenant like I did to your predecessor. So David doesn't have like secret information that we don't have access to. We very much could see what David had in view, and that is his descendants would continue the line all the way through. But Mashiach... David was also a Mashiach. He was also anointed. So what, we, um, we, we're, what we're doing is we're using conventional language now, which is fine, but we can impose that into the biblical narrative because the, the Bible doesn't use language like that. You, you talked about the term Messiah not being like not that common in the Old Testament. 39 times, not, not that common. So, right. so, okay, so what, what other kind of language is used to refer to Messiah, like what other Nussi. terminologies? That's is, the big one, Nasi. Nasi, the Hebrew word Nasi, which means okay. prince. That's the big one, yes. Prince, okay. Uh, from, from Daniel chapter seven, how do you understand this son of how is it, like, what's the term in the, in the Hebrew Bible from Daniel chapter 7? We, we have in the English, son of man. What's, right, um, so strikingly, what you say the Hebrew Bible, but as it turns out, Daniel 7 is in Aramaic. And, right, then, yeah, yeah, okay. um, so the term that's used there, so does that mean it's, it's not, not in Hebrew, it's Aramaic. Okay. Aramaic is a sister language of the Hebrew language. They're very close. They're strikingly close. But from Daniel chapter 2, verse 4, all the way to the end of this chapter, chapter 7, it's all in Aramaic. It's the largest segment of Aramaic anywhere in Tanakh. So the term there is kivar enosh, one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven to, the text says, the ancient of days. That means God. Okay. And he's like a son of man because, so this is very important. It's vital for you watching the show that you read Daniel 7 in context. Or you'll have no, this will sound like totally outrageous. What, what, what clouds like a son of man? What, 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 what's coming into view here? So Daniel's had a vision which are non veridical um, uh, visions of beasts who represent the enemies of Israel. 
the lion. So he's not really seeing a lion that has wings. Not like there was actually a lion there. He's seeing this in a, a dream of the night. There's a bear with three ribs. I mean, if you want to believe it was veridical and he actually saw it, fine. You know, but that 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 no, that, no, no, it's, it's a vision. It's a vision. It's, 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 it's a clearly vision. it's these yeah. are this yeah, is yeah. a non-veridical For vision. Sure. Okay, he's seeing a leopard with four heads. So what is what is the term veridical? Excuse me. What is the term veridical? Right. Mean? So like, like if, if you're if I'm seeing something actually seems like the children of Israel saw the sea part. So that's veridical. You're actually seeing what's happening. Conversely, David is having a vision, but there really wasn't a lion with wings. It didn't actually exist. It only existed in his own mind. But it was a prophetic vision. Now, moreover, there are. 15% of healthy people hallucinate. There's a, a very significant number of people who actually see things or hear things that are not there. And in almost all cases, they're about loved ones or loved ones or religious figures, right? So those they're, they're having those experiences in all religions and all cultures, and, and people are speaking in tongues in all religions, but these are non-veridical experiences, very powerful, no, but, and veridical means you're actually seeing and it's really there. You're actually seeing something. So, so what's happening is it's like a lion. That's the point. It's not really because it's a very strange lion. It's a very strange leopard to have four heads. We now know it's Alexander the Great. His He died at 32. Four kingdoms emerged from him. And then we have Rome, Edom. We have the final, the most horrible beast of all, indescribable. Now, what, what comes after that is he sees one like a son of man. So son of man in Tanakh means what it sounds like. He is not divine, but a mortal. This is very important. Um, Ezekiel, when he has a vision, the most outstanding vision in the Hebrew Bible, possibly the opening chapters of Ezekiel, God says, "You're now that's in Hebrew, that you're ben adam, son of man, because in all the other religions, the people who were divine people were not the son of a man. They were only the son of a woman. So here is one like a son of man. This is the Messiah coming to the Ancient of Days. That means he's coming to God. And then the next verse, lay yehiv shaltan, that to him will be given all authority and all nations will serve him. And and that's very much Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10. Very, very similar. Daniel's going to come back to the angel and go, wait, we need to, what am I, what is this? So Daniel actually has the same question, like what, and most importantly, what's the deal with the fourth, that fourth beast with 10 horns and then another horn that is, um, like, what's that? That's, that was so, something so horrible. In Jewish tradition, that's um, all the Roman emperors from Julius Caesar, who technically was a dictator, not an emperor, but there were 10 from Julius Caesar to Vespasian, 10 emperors of Rome and 10 leaders of Rome, and then the little horn is Titus, and he's the 11th. He was the general during the destruction temple, and he... So, Ro like, Rome is... The what would you call it? like the anti? It's the implacable enemy of God, and Rome has a feature that we see because there are many examples of. In fact, I say to you, the view whenever you see four in the Bible, like even Abraham defeating four kings before Melchizedek gave him the the bread and wine. There's four. There's four enemies that Abraham had to defeat. So whenever you see, so the fourth. In this case, it's a beast that has, it's really indescribable, 10 horns and a, 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 a boastful horn. And what, what will be with that, that beast that it will try to change the time and the laws? And that's what the church did. It says you don't have to keep the laws anymore, and it changed the Jewish calendar, changed it all. So, um, so the last is always, it morphs. So the Roman Empire... Was what a great empire that was, but it changed dramatically. It kept dividing, and it it eventually becomes Christian and a doctor. Constantine in three twelve in the in the fall of three twelve 
becomes, adopts the Christian religion, the Roman Catholic religion. He's the first Christian emperor of Rome. He will convene the Council of Nicaea, not because he was such a religious man, but because he wanted a unified empire under unified doctrine. And although the, doc, the idea of the Trinity was already thought of centuries earlier, it was invented by a second century um, thinker, Tertullian, or third century, yeah, um, but he hammers that all out. So Rome is changing dramatically, and now the empire is Christian. I'm using that word. If you're a Protestant, please don't be offended. I'm just using the word. And so, and then I'm just saying it to the audience because some audiences will go would would bristle the notion that that they, and I understand that. And then of course you have Theodosius, who was the last emperor to preside both over the east and the west in the end of the fifth century, at the end of the fourth century. And then you'd have the great split, which ultimately would explode in 1054. So again it morphs and morphs and changes and changes again in a, a reformation in the 16th century that would and so it does more, but it keeps holding on to the idolatry. It keeps holding on to the rejection of the Torah and of the time. And um, and that's the last kingdom. So the last kingdom is changing, is changing, but it's the same thing. It just regurgitated over and over again. Well, Rome has, Rome has a way of adapting to circumstances, doesn't it? Rome can, Rome can kind of understand where the current is going and kind of change. We, we're seeing that today. Um, that means today we're seeing the Roman Catholic Church adapting to whatever the societal norms are. I, I, I think that earlier emperors before Constantine were not that accommodating to Christianity. I, I don't think Diocletian was. No, they that's well, they were sure. not accommodating to Christianity. Yeah, no, a certain emperor Diocletian, who was the yeah. process of, of Constantine, certainly mm -hmm. was. Today, the Catholic Church is trying to dig its way out of a, of a horror, of a nightmare, where its sin against the most innocent has been revealed. Whereas the Catholic Church presented itself as the protectors of the unborn, the protectors of the most innocent. That's how it portrayed itself. As it turns out, it was that institution that committed the greatest crimes against the children of the most innocent. That's not an accident. That's the nature of this beast. And therefore now, and that's why Benedict XVI, no doubt, was removed and this pope was put in his place because the, the, the position of Rome now is what could we do to hide the secret? And, and, and that's why, well, whatever you want, we'll go with it. But it's, it's completely ungodly. Yeah, the, the matter of early Christianity as a anti, like the early Christians were really anti-emperor kind of, you know. My view is different on that. I think that the, yeah, I think that Paul... I don't know if he really was a citizen of Rome as Acts says he was. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But Paul was um, protective of the empire. And, in, and Paul takes that very far, especially in Romans chapter 13, where he is saying that, in fact, the rulers are there because God put them there and don't rebel against them. And rebelling against the people in power is essentially a rebellion against God. We see that in the the first epistle of Peter is is clear as well. I mean, the, the, don't 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 mess with the empire. Don't fight with the people who are in, in a state of power. And I think that Pontius Pilate is portrayed as a lackey of the Jews and really sees Jesus as innocent. He and his wife in Matthew's in Matthew's passion narrative. I, I don't think the New Testament is anti-Roman. Well, I thank you for having me on, Tom. I, I'm very okay. well, delighted to hear, to spend um, this time with you. Okay, so this, and I wish you and all your interview. readers a shalom. Uh, and maybe we'll meet each other in Jerusalem. And, uh, <laughs> 
בחפץ או קול. אזי מלך, אזי מלך, שמו נקרא. ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא 